Hey guys, John here. Um, this is another episode of Volta's Dungeon Master. Uh, before I begin with my topic today, uh, let's say, uh, as you can see, I uh, changed the scenery from my last video. I am back home for the holidays. Um, yep, came back home from Slippery Rock, back up here in Scranton. So I'm back here and just surviving and waiting for next semester. Um, anyway, on that note, I hope everyone had a good holiday. Um, I had a very good one. Uh, doing, been doing a lot of gaming with my group back up here. And doing a lot of fun stuff here. I also got a brand new camera. Uh, as you can tell, I'm kind of back to my old setup here in front of my wall with Faerun and Lady Pendraim behind me. And my sword and Lord Soth. And uh, yeah, back to my old setup. Uh, I like this setup a lot better than doing the webcam just because I'm actually, I can use my hands, I can reach things, you know, I just, I like this setup better and I'm really glad I have my camera back because it really was a deterrent before for me, to just mentally. But anyway, enough of that. Um, as I said, uh, this video topic is a continuation of my, la of my last video, Shut Up Phone. Um, it's a continuation of my last video that was um, on uh, different kinds of magic and how I perceive them in my game. You know, you have the arcane, you have the divine, you have the uh, primal divine druid magic. Um, I will talk about these again, but in terms of organizations or orders or schools or circles, um, of the different orders. So, like, wizard schools, cleric orders, or churches, temples, and druid circles. It's probably going to be a bit long of a video. Uh, it may even be two parts. Uh, I haven't really known. Uh, so yeah, really, it's kind of going to be a long, rambly video. So you're better off just picking a drink and, uh, listen to my ideas. Like I said, I think they're interesting and I just want to get the information out there so people can watch and look at them and weigh in their two cents and take uh, ideas from them for, for their games. Alright. First in this topic I will, talk, I will discuss are the schools of wizardry or Wizards Towers, or Mages Guild, Mages College, any, any of that type of thing. Um, and that is kind of schools for magic users, uh, more predominantly wizards, where young, wiz where young magic users go to train and become fine wizards and understanding the knowledge of their craft. This, in a modern sense, in a modern fantasy sense, is Hogwarts from Harry Potter, where you have these young kids going and training under these master wizards and learning spells and conducting them properly in safe environments. And that's probably the key to any wizarding school in any fantasy setting, is that it's safe. Uh, magic, as I stated in my previous video, is a science. It's very volatile. It's awaken, you know, it, it can cause a lot of damage to things. Um, so wizards, especially if they're the academic type to be living in, to be teaching at a school or going to a school, need a proper place to experiment and study and perfect their craft. And that's why the, the schools are the tower. That, that's why the stigma is that they are in schools or towers. Because it's just, it's a safe stronghold that no one really bothers them. Um, that's just kind of a general overview. Um, an example of this really is, um, a very good example of this, of the towers, is, uh, the Towers of High Sorcery from Dragonlance, where you have the, all the mages getting together and working, for the most part, together. Well, 
they have the different orders. But uh, they're all experimenting on their own, but they're in a very safe place. And they can't be disturbed by outside forces like, oh, the orc armies, the dragons, you know, the, those types of things. So yeah, in that terms, wizard towers are very good. They all, but they also, these towers, create a lot of mystery with general people. Uh, at least in Dragonlance and in, uh, in, other, in other fiction, I'm sure. Because you have this. These mages sit in this tower above this hill and they are just... They never leave, you know. No one ever sees them, so like if they're by a village, you know, the villagers are pretty wicked out and they may even want to kill the wizards because they don't, you know, it's the fear of the unknown. So that's actually a very interesting campaign arc. You could have, you know, you could do it from the villagers' perspective, you could do it from the mages' perspective, you know, the mages defending their tower and defending their knowledge, or you can have it as the villagers trying to destroy the tower, or, you know, you obviously can you know, a little bit of both, you know dip your hands into both pots, and, and that's cool. That'd be a cool campaign. You could also do uh, campaigns with Wizard's Towers, or also you could do it where it's like school, you know, it's a mage college, or it's Hogwarts, where it's, excuse me, um, where you have these massive amounts of um, students and teachers all trying to perfect crafts and study, it just, you could have a very cool quest line there, you know. Case in point, you know, take ideas from the Elder Scrolls games, you know, like Skyrim. They have a Mage College quest line, which is really cool. That That's all about kind of finding ancient magics and studying them and harnessing them, you know. So, that would be really cool in a D&D &D campaign, I think. Yeah, really well. Um... You also have, as a lot of academic societies, like colleges and whatnot, it is very much a game uh, where it's you, ta you could roleplay a lot of the aspects of students trying to get higher GPAs, being cutthroat, always trying to get into programs. You know, you could have professors competing for tenure. You know, you could have a lot of fun with it, especially, you know, if you're familiar with that aspect of life. You could just you know, it'd be it'd be really cool quest lines and sabotage. It's a lot. Of, it's intrigue, but in a different light. We know we normally think of intrigue as the town or the city or the kingdom. This is intrigue in a kind of smaller, more isolated way, and it just that, that'd be fun. Um, but yeah, before I move on to my next topic, yeah, wizard schools are cool, um, and also you. They're cool and really offer a lot of interesting role-playing situations. Um, like I said, you know, a lot of a lot of interesting intrigue stuff could work there. Um, uh, but yeah, no, if anyone uh, let me know. Like like I said, if you guys have any ideas of how to make campaigns like this work, I'd be more than willing. To hear them, you know, put them in the comment or make a video response. You know, I'm always looking for those. But um, and yeah, because I think it's these topics are just interesting ideas for D and D and fantasy games that don't necessarily get utilized a lot. You know, but anyway, uh, moving from the wizards and their arcane magic, gonna now switch gears to. Holy uh, and Knightly Orders, and this is the reason why they're kind of together is because they are very much one of the same. You know, Holy Orders like uh, monks and priests, you know, these types of guys are like, it's a, you know, a sect or a cluster or a cell of devoted worshippers who worship their god either in private or publicly and they fight for their god um it's really what it comes down to is they um 
do a lot to make sure that they're aware of their faith and their God and what their God wants. And yeah, so the many people in these types of orders are clerics or priests, paladins, and even monks to some degree, especially if you wanted to uh, have kind of like a kind of traditional Western European monk. Uh, they're typically not the monks of D&D, they're more of the clerics or the, sp or the priests, like the specialty priests, the world-wearing priests, but they're cleric class. Um, but yeah, um, these orders once again offer a lot of interesting political sides to them. You know, like, uh, once again, back to Dragonlance, the Knights of Salamnia. Um, both in the books and in, you know, the modules that they've written, have a lot of intrigue to them, especially in the books, you know, where there's constant backstabbing of fellow knights and whatnot. You know, and that's very, it's interesting and it's, you know, it's unique, you know, it's preserving, it's, you know, in a way it's kind of, they, they do it, to, they backstab people to preserve their order, but they really end up just killing, killing themselves. So yeah, you have a lot of cool ideas with hol holy and knightly orders, because they just, a lot of times, the divine champions of gods are movers and shakers of the world. They are active in political... Because everyone has faith. You know, especially, like, if you're... Everyone has faith and everyone tries to not get on the gods' bad side. Especially in worlds where the gods are pretty active. I mean, they have, cl they have champions and clerics who have their power. You know? You kind of start bowing down when you actually see it, because as, as the old adage is, seeing is believing. So yeah, um, also a lot more with cleric and knightly orders, you have a lot more of the potential for one intrigue within the order itself and also within po political systems, because they're so connected. You have both, you know, you have a good example is, um, historically, the Roman Catholic Church, the selling of indulgences to rich people, you know, this idea that, you know, you'll be spared from hellfire and damnation if you pay me a hundred gold, or, you know, two hundred gold or three hundred gold, you know, the list goes, that, that goes on and on, and so yeah, you have that idea, and, um, That's just very interesting. You also have um, priests in with as king's advisors. You know, Cardinal Cardinal Richelieu from the Three Musketeers books. You know, he's he is a man of God, but he very much has his own agenda. But yeah. Um, But yeah, no. Uh, another thing with clerics and paladins and all the and those types of holy divine classes and characters, they they are because of their nature. They are. It's a lot easy to get them active in a campaign than really any other class because it's. You can say. The paladin is go is traveling and. The paladin is part of the guard, and he is ordered to go accompany this band of adventurers to go kill the dragon or whatever. It's a lot easier of a transition that makes a lot more sense, and really kind of doesn't feel as railroady because it's that that that's your job, you know. It kind of lowers the bars of what's really kind of railroady, especially if you have a really good DM, you know, you can move it along very quickly. Um, but yeah, clerics the same thing, you know, the clerics and priests, you know, they're going out to either spread their faith or purge, a you know, get rid of enemies of their faith, you know, that's another big thing. So yeah, um, like I said, divine magic is just in general, one, it's more widely accepted to people because it's 
god magic, it's divine. Well, you know, arcane is more man-made magic, you know, the more inner things that are much more complicated and weird. But yeah, anyway, yeah, um, like, I, I might even do separate videos on these. But this just, this video is just kind of an overview. And, um, Lastly, the last thing I'd like to talk about is um, druid circles. Because druids in D&D aren't necessarily the... They're kind of the class that's like, yeah, okay. They kind of get tossed aside a lot of the times because, you know, they're not... They don't have the armor and... Weapon proficiencies as cleric. You know, they don't, they don't have the armor proficiencies as clerics. They don't. Um, and they're not made, and they don't get the high level spells of wizards and, and magic users. So, druids are very kind of in their own little niche, as it were, of their own. And they are really the. How I best describe it, and how I've come to see it through a lot of research, is um, they are the ancient magics. Like, they were the first spell casters before, you know, clerics came along and made their temples. Druids are doing the same thing, but with sacrifices and appeasement to the gods in a very nature way. You know, whether it's, um, I was doing research, you know, with the Celtic mythos, with the Celtic druids, which is, that's what druids in D&D are based off of. I was really reading in this book here, Deities and Demigods, which, which by the way, if anyone can get either this or Legends of Lore, the second printing, I highly recommend it. Because this book is a great reference for anything I'm talking about here. It's just, it's a great reference for gods and orders and clerics, even the... 3.5 version, you know, the, the third edition of one of this is just pick up a book like this because it is neat and it's good for DMs to have. And even players, it's good to look at them. Um, but yeah, druids. Um, as it, it was saying in this one that uh, a lot of the druids have ceremonies. Uh, a lot of them require uh, holly and mistletoe, which are hex charms. As I've heard them referred to in a different couple, couple places. So, and um, also sacrifices either of sap from a tree or blood, which that is true. Most druidic, from what I've read and heard about in a documentary on National Geographic ones, that most druids are, m most druid accounts, especially coming from Julius Caesar's, uh, I think it was Julius Caesar, correct me if I'm wrong. Nicely. Um, it was that he he came, he went to Britain and it, for the first time when he invaded, and he saw it. And he saw these Druids. They didn't care about their people. They treated them like slaves. They, you know, sacrificed them. And it was. Now we don't know if these accounts are true or not. Now there have been investigations that yes, there have been spots that. They have an of druid, excuse me, of druid activity that were, they did find human remains, but, you know, that's period skeptical. We don't know if Julius Caesar accounts are true, just because we don't live, you know, it's thousands of years after that, after the fact. Um, but yeah, also, what's in the Indies and Demigods was, they had holidays, you know, they had the, the winter solstice and the summer solstice. You know, and also the spring equinox, you know, the vernal equinox. You know, longest day of the year, shortest day of the year, you know, longest night, longest day, beginning of spring, you know, th those types of things. Which is very interesting because that also starts with a lot of cleric stuff. Clerics and gods have holy days and feast days that, you know, kind of originates there. So, druids are very much kind of the offshoot, you know, they're the early clerics and the early magic users, because they very much, druid magic is very much a combination of the two. Druids are, they started out in D&D as a subclass to cleric. 
And then later they became more of the nature-based, you know, nature's ally kind of thing. But, they're very much divine in nature. They are very much a divine class. However, they use more nature and being one with nature to work through everything. And they also use the components of nature. Components, keyword there, because that also goes back to magic users. So it's kind of like there's this split from druid to the clerics and mages. So it kind of goes back to druids, which is cool. That's another idea that you can play with. Also, druid circles are very secretive. And so, like, you know, they're very much isolated sects throughout the world. They don't like to, like... They, they allow outsiders from other sects in, but, you know, they don't mate with them. They're very much internal. It's all internal. It's a very interesting, a very interesting way that you can play with it if, people, if you want to do, like, a low kind of magic, myst mystical setting for a game. Druids work very, really well because Druids are very much Gandalf from Lord of the Rings. Now, that's not entirely accurate, because Gandalf is a wizard. But, druids are more protectors. They Their types of magic isn't necessarily to cast the big fireball, but it works. You know, it's... I know if... I know these... This component... This, this, well, this component put together makes fire. And that can keep me warm. That can warn off enemies. You know, that's very much... Tolkien magic in a nutshell, where it's very kind of Druidic based, where it's, you know, it's there. It doesn't have to be explained, but it's there. It's, you know, the old adage of it's magic, I don't have to explain it. That's kind of more Druids. You know, magic users try to explain everything with magic. You know, as a scientist, tries to explain everything with science. And clerics try to say, it's the God's will. The Druids are just kind of like, it's magic. You know, it's... The druids don't take a side. That's why druids are typically neutral in alignment. But anyway. Very much. This has been a rambly video. I know you people... My, my, I know most of you viewers like my rambling. But also, uh, that's kind of my little tidbit there on... Schools, orders, and circles. Uh, it's a bit of a side note, just because I was thinking about this. Ceremonies and holidays. Like, druids have their ceremonies. And clerics have holidays and feast days. And majors could have that too. But a lot, this is also another really good way of getting people to start, is that it's a ceremony. You know, uh, druids, as it said, you know, they look towards the celestial alignment or whatever and you know they may predict something like a great cataclysm type event will happen on the feast the feast of this day at this time you know it's prophecy you know it's very cool and that's actually very much a druid thing to do uh because like i said primal ancient priest you know that speaks for the trees in a way but yeah um also but yeah, so ceremony, it's a great way of role-playing. It's also a lot of minutia that a lot of people forget about. Because there are... In Greyhawk, there's ceremonies and holidays. Forgotten Realms has them. Dragonlance has them. Everyone has them. You know, and even people on YouTube, you know, other people I watch on YouTube have made ceremonies. And it'd just be very cool to have, I think, for a campaign world, an actual calendar drawn out. You know, kind of keep track. You know, I'm kind of getting in that frame of mind that I kind of like the... a lot of the simulation game aspects of it. You know, like this, this, this. I kind of like that. I mean, I like the game and miniatures, but I really do love... especially when I'm DMing, I love the world building and the... the, the society building more. Anyway, yeah. Um, bit of a long video, but I thought... Uh, be interesting to talk about. It. I might do more. Definitely going to have more videos coming out away while I'm home. Um, but anyway, 
like I said, uh, totally pick up a cop copy. If you can't get a copy of this or Legends of Lore, get PDFs. They're out there and just read over them. They're great. It's a great reference tool for any DM or regardless of if you're really fantasy or even just really just curious. You know, if you want to learn about things, you know, like Babylonians, Celtics, Greek, you know, this is a great reference guide. This is great. And it'll open doors for you. But anyway, as always, I'm John. This has been another episode of Ultimate Dungeon Master, and happy game.